Edgar, I feel so privileged because I am going to be able to ask you a whole bunch of nerdy questions. And look, it's my mission to not ask things you've been asked a million times, maybe just a hundred thousand times. So how about this one? A nice softball. Okay. What is the film you think you've seen most in your entire life? Oh, in, you mean other films? I was only prepped for movies that I've done, so this is this is a straight a curveball straight away. Look, I'm really sorry. That's a good question. I was thinking about this myself the other day, and I could think of some top contenders. It would be somewhere between 2001, A Space Odyssey. Open the pod bay doors, Hal. I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. Airplane, exclamation mark. I just want to tell you both good luck. We're all counting on you. This is Spinal Tap. Rock and roll! Rock and roll! Rock and roll! Evil Dead 2. Groovy. Raising Arizona. I need a baby high. They got more than they can handle. Carrie. Baby It'd be one of those. American Wealth in London, that would be the other one. Did you hear that? And all of those films I've seen upwards of 10 times. And in fact, 2001 has become the film that I've seen the most at the cinema because it's not one that I usually like watching at home. But whenever it's on at the cinema, I go. A lot of Pavlovian responses like, oh, 2001 is on, I'm going to go. So which one would you pick out of those? I go for 2001 because I have an incredible memory of watching it at the Royal Festival Hall with an orchestra, and it was a transcendental experience. It was yeah. just... It feels a little bit like going to an art gallery in a, in a great way. I mean, you feel like sort of... The further you get away from that film, the more amazing it is that a major studio made it. I mean, because you wouldn't get something like that made today, sadly. Imagine the elevator pitch. It begins, and you go... I need more than one elevator. <laughs> <laughs> I've often wondered. I've often wanted to read the script of 2001 because I like to see what it actually says written down, you know. <laughs> but um, but yeah, I'd say that. So it's somewhere between. Let's say it's somewhere between 2001 and Airplane. <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful. And by the way, that would be an incredible septuple bill. Those seven movies back to back have to happen. <laughs> what would you say is your favorite quote unquote children's film? I guess like. Uh, Bugsy Malone would be a good one. Roxy Robinson. You work with Fat Sam? It's like beautifully done. The songs are all killer. I actually would like You Give a Little Love to be played at my funeral. You give a little love. Followed by a pie fight at the wake. Wouldn't it be great to have a pie fight at the wake? Guys, I'm not saying we should get rid of Edgar, <laughs> but I really want to see that in my lifetime. I like a re <sighs> fake funeral. Listen, let's hope I die before you and then you can come. <laughs> I've got a question for you, which I hope you'll play along with, right? TV Tropes, mm. one of the best websites on the planet. You can get lost there for years and years and years. Incredible. They have a list of Edgar Wright's creator thumbprints, right? So your directorial trademarks. Would you care to guess what's on their list? What's the matter, David? I'm taking a shortcut before. People jumping over fences. <laughs> <laughs> That's not a trope, I guess. They don't say it explicitly. Oh, no. Like fast transitions, is that one of them? They've got smash zooms, whip pans, unconventional transitions. Do you know that girl? Scott! What? You only played one note for that entire song. How many do you want me to guess? There are 10. I mean, um, like pop culture references, is that one of them? Oh, you're looking for JD? International man of mystery. Cause he's long gone, baby. <laughs> yes, loving homage. Like needle drops, like music. 
So what they do with music is something called Mickey Mousing. Right. Where you match, as you do, the song to the beat of the scene. Right, 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 right. Aller Baby Driver and yeah. many other moments in your, you know, back catalogue. Okay, John, it's time at the bar. So that's what they call it, Mickey Mousing. What, because the old Disney things were sort of Mickey Mouse is timed to the music? Exactly. Ah. Uh, they teach me everything and I know nothing. They've also got big time foreshadowing. Yes. Next time I see him, he's dead. Creepy twins. <laughs> yes. Did you believe him? Huh? Now, tell me where the twins are in Last Night in Soho. It's staring you in the face. It's in the trailer. It's not. It's not the students. No. Is it in the? Is it in the first sixties club? Yes. Are they at the bar? No. Are they in one of the booths? No. I'm out. Uh, do you want me to tell you? Please. So, James and Oliver Phelps, the Weasley twins from oh. Harry Potter. <laughs> Ready, Fred? Ready, George. Bottoms up. Are both playing the maitre d' in the lobby because... Oh, idiot boy. Because the first, like, mirror scene in the movie with Thomason and Anya is, like, there's no mirror. But there are, like two maitre d's. So the Phelps twins played the maitre d's. And what's funny is that I don't think because they were sort of, their hair was different and they were all dressed up on both Thomason and Anya on the day of shooting when I said, oh, you know, like um, James and Oliver from Harry Potter, they both, they both completely flipped out in a way if somebody said, oh, you know, Clint Eastwood's standing over there. <laughs> like, <laughs> so I've never seen like two actresses more starstruck by the idea. Suddenly, like that was the big focus of the scene is like... You know Jesus is over there. Yeah. And also it's a complicated scene with lots of choreography. So I suddenly thought like, oh, maybe I made a mistake by telling them it was the Weasley twins. When you notice their eyes wandering in one take, going... <laughs> Perhaps not. Just to rattle through these, we've got... Uh, Idealism. Oh, yeah, yeah. Sorry, I couldn't hear you. I have a banana in my ear. We have Mundane Made Awesome. Yes. I think that's like, was written just for you. That would be like kind of showing the spreading of jam on toast as if it was like from a James Cameron movie or something. Yeah, for me, it's the carrying of a, of a pot plant on a train. <laughs> taxi, taxi. That sort of thing. And the final one is, and this is why I think your movies bear so many rewatches, right? Is the freeze frame bonus. How old is she? Um, I gotta pee on her. I mean, I gotta pee. Is that... Every frame's a painting. Oh, thank you've, you. You've got all these different hidden bits and bobs. Are there any particular moments where you get impressed that people spot them? That, that people come up to you and say, did you intentionally do X or Y in the background of a shot? I guess there's tiny things like, you know, I, I sort of was inspired by Peter Greenaway's Drowning by Numbers which kind of like has the alphabet through the movie. And I always thought that was really interesting. So there are little things like in Scott Pilgrim, there is like the sort of the, the amount of X's on screen sort of shows you where you are in the film. And it's because the, in Toronto, the, the street signs would have these X's where they'd have yellow X's and white X's. So a point in the movie where we're two X's down, but there's five to go, there's a wide shot where there's like five yellow X's and two white ones. Or it might be the other way around. But that's something where, like, somebody goes, ah, you, we're showing where we are in the movie. And then later in the movie, there's things like the kind of the, um, the Kati Yanagi twins in, like, the penultimate fight turn their, like, amp up to the Japanese for 11. <laughs> like, so I guess it's only people who know the Japanese numbers that get that joke, say, oh, it's like a Spinal Tap reference. These go to 11. It's just like, we just thought it'd be funny to have, like, 11 in Japanese. 
I'm always impressed when people kind of get things very quickly as well. Mm. I think that came from actually having done Spaced, is that Space sort of was was on TV just as the internet was really starting to. Um, it's like X Files forum era. Yeah, exactly. If you're not one of those sci fi nerds, no. You don't spend your evening on the internet discussing symbolism and the X Files. Look, modern science fiction can be pretty interesting. The thoughts and speculations of our contemporary authors and thinkers have probably never been closer to the truth. And we had this forum that started from the third episode in, started by this guy called Nick Lee. And what was just really an eye opener was that, like, there was nothing that people didn't get. Groovy. And there was, like, little things for people to obsess about. So when we were writing Shaun of the Dead, we knew that, like, we could pack in lots of detail. And it would just kind of keep people, like, talking about it a lot. I don't want to cause a fuss. We're coming to get you, Barbara. I think the main thing is, is that you you should never, like, talk down to the audience. And I think, weirdly, you become more universal the more specific you get. I agree. Thanks, man. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to subscribe and click the bell icon to keep up to date. You can listen to my Radio 1 movies and TV podcast, Screen Time, on BBC Sounds. And you can find these interviews in full on BBC iPlayer by searching Movies with Ali Plum. Skip to the end.